Thank you. That's awesome. You sure? I am. There we go. Cool. Hey, all right. The Army guy needed the Navy guy to do it. Come here, buddy. Come here. I'm going to give you a break. Go. Wasn't that interesting? They uh, introduced us to a song by Senator Kid Rock. Is it too soon? Yeah, it's may maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow what a crowd awesome hey man you look really good thank you who I... picked out your wardrobe <laughs> the jokes are seriously writing themselves at this point I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say it because we're in the presidential library oh man so well uh great to see so many wonderful uh, and friendly faces uh, and those of you that aren't friendly are welcome to stand in the back <laughs> Uh, but uh, no, great to have you with us. Uh, we're going to go ahead and jump in. We, you guys have been patient uh, and waiting. So, uh, so hey, Rob, the one question everybody wants to know is, um, how did a guy from Butte, Montana, end up in the Navy, much less uh, uh, having a career like that's you? Funny. That's funny. Um, that's actually a really interesting question because I'm a big believer that, that uh, life is what happens around you while you're making a plan that like 95% of the stuff you worry about never happens anyway. Um, so it kind of just like, I joined the Navy because of a girl. Uh, on accident. And it's actually the, the first uh, sentence in the, my book, The Operators, is about that. I, I had my heart broken by um, a girl named Hillary in Butte, Montana. And uh, I was never going to join the military. It wasn't a lifelong dream, but I decided in one day that I need to get out of town, and, and I had two friends that were two years older than me that always wanted to be Marines growing up, and, and, and when they graduated high school, they joined the Marine Corps same day, went to Paris Island together, and every time they came home, I remember looking at them thinking, you know, that's awesome, you know, Marines are tough, they're strong, they're confident, the uniforms are incredible, and when I decided to leave town, I was like, that's, I want to do that, I'm going to join the Marine Corps, so I went to join the Marines, and as luck would have it, you know, because sometimes it's better to be lucky that it is to be good, the, the Marine recruiter was not in the office. <laughs> and the, uh, the Navy guy was. So I looked over there, and, and uh, the only reason I went into the Navy guy's office was because my two Marine friends told me something I didn't know, and many of you may not know. Uh, they actually said that the Marine Corps is actually part of the Department of the Navy. It's just, it's just the men's department. <laughs> so I went in there to, to ask him... Uh, Where's the Marine? Because if anyone's going to know where he is, this guy will. And he goes, well, why do you want the Marine? I said, well, I want to be a sniper. And Marines have the best snipers in the world. They said, well, look no further. We have snipers right here in the Navy. You need to become a SEAL first, no big deal. But then you get, like, <laughs> you kind of glossed over that whole thing. So you got to figure, I'm a 19-year-old I'm a kid from Montana that didn't know how to swim. Not a lot of swimming going on. It's very cold up there, high altitude. But I'm, th I'm looking at him like, you know, I'm 19. I'm kind of naive. This guy, though, is a professional recruiter. Why is he going to lie to me? <laughs> and uh, I signed up that day. And then he, he made me, uh, he, we watched the recruiting video after we signed the paperwork. And I was like, man, I'm in kind of a pickle here. I don't know how to swim. I just signed with the government to be a SEAL. And uh, then I just started thinking, you know, well, Okay, I found out about SEAL training. I probably won't make it through, but at least it's an adventure. Um, you know, I'll go there. I probably won't make it through SEAL training. And, and then, you know, in four years, I'll have sea stories when I come back. And, and uh, I went to the Navy, learned that like 95% of the all-volunteer military is there because of a girl. <laughs> and, uh, and then I, I went to SEAL training. And, I, you know, I worked hard. And I, I, I just proved, you know, and, and just because... Uh, you know, that day because of a girl and not knowing how to swim and joining the Navy and then 17 years later in Bin Laden's bedroom. It's, it's, it's just proof that you, it doesn't matter where you're from or what you look like. You can do anything you want as long as you avoid negativity, stay positive, work hard, and never quit. And run away from a girl. <laughs> I mean, I mean you got to figure a lot of things happen because, because of a girl. Look at our 45th president. <laughs> He, he beat Hillary, it's funny. You know? uh, I, pro I promised Rob I wouldn't get political. So. <laughs> and that went out the door. Um, so uh, I think, well, you, you touched on it, uh, but the group probably wants to know, so you didn't know how to swim. Yeah. 
Okay, um, that might be something you need to do for SEAL training. That was another interesting one. Yeah, how's that happen? I, I, like I said, I didn't know how to swim, but I figured how hard could it be? <laughs> and I went to, uh, I went to the pool. I played, I played a year of college basketball at Montana Tech, and I went up there where they had a pool. And I, I didn't know any technique, and I'm standing at the edge of the, uh, of the pool. I'm like, okay, it's 25 meters down, 25 meters back. I'll swim 1,000 meters, you know, just kind of gauge my workout from there. Um, and that was fine. Uh, everything was working out with my plan until I entered the water. And that's, uh, so I made it down to the end and sort of back to where I could touch my toes. I'm like, man, I'm in a pickle. I, I just did two lengths, not even 50 yards, and uh, I'm exhausted. And, and uh, a buddy of mine that, sw that I went to high school with, one of the few guys that did swim, uh, he actually went on to swim four years in Notre Dame. He came up to me, his name was Mike Driscoll, and he said, uh, hey, Rob, don't get me wrong, it's great to see you, but I've never seen you in the pool before. Today, you won't get us. I said, oh, I just joined the Navy today, and um, I'm, I'm going to be a SEAL. <laughs> and he said, uh, yeah, not like that, you're not. So he, he got me, and he actually taught me the breaststroke and the side stroke. He worked with me. For, I, I, I signed up for the delayed entry program, which means I signed, and then I left in five months. So uh, my buddy Mike taught me in, in five months how to, how to swim. And uh, then I went to the Navy. <laughs> so uh, fast forward, yep. made it through boot camp. Yep. Got to uh, glorious uh, this Southern California. Yep. Uh, so talk about you know kind of your first couple experiences with so uh, uh, buds. every SEAL goes through training just south of here in San Diego called uh, Basic Underwater Demolition SEAL Training, uh, or BUDS as we call it. It's, it's the hardest training in the world. You know, 85% of the people who try out don't make it. It's, it's, in a, it's, it's, it's tough. Um, it's in a lot of the books, a lot of the movies, and it's, it's essentially just, um, it's like a beat down for eight months. Where it, it, gets, it gets so hard. I remember, I remember being there, I can, I can see it if it was yesterday, where it's like, I, I, I know I have a past, I came from somewhere, I don't have a future, I'm just going to be in hell. As far as I can tell, that that's it, and and, and uh, that's when we started to learn how to how to uh, compartmentalize everything. It's not like how do I get from now to graduation, and this is good advice for life. You know, it's not how do I get this long term goal done. It's like um, you know, wake up in the morning on time, and make your bed the right way, then brush your teeth. You know, little victories. Make it to 5 a.m. workout on time, and then make it to breakfast. And after breakfast, think about getting to lunch. And after lunch, get to dinner. And after dinner, do everything you need to do to get back in that perfectly made bed. And regardless of how bad your day was, you get a fresh start tomorrow because the day is, 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 you know, the bed's made. And, and um, I had an instructor tell me, when you feel like quitting, which you will, and I did every day, don't quit now, just quit tomorrow. That's it, you know, little, little victories. And then all of a sudden, it's five days before graduation. I remember thinking, well, shit, now I'm going to be a Navy SEAL. What am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> But just, you know, just little victories at a time. It's never the long-term goals. It's short-term goals getting to the long-term goals. And, and like SEAL training was, uh, um, you know, you're doing 1,000 push-ups a day, 1,000 sit-ups a day, 1,000 flutter kicks a day, hundreds of pull-ups, all kinds of – we would – there was a spot, like a generalized spot where we would get tortured. And it was, it was a mile from there to the chow hall. So every day we're running six miles just to eat. And that's not even working out. That's just to get to the chow hall. Additional, you know, 14 miles a day, and it's, uh, yeah, it's a really tough course, but that's, uh, um, you know, one, one of the traits that's common with a lot of Navy SEALs is a sense of humor, because it gets so bad if you can't laugh at yourself. Like, what kind of horrible decision, why did she dump me? Why am I here? You know, you're going to lose your mind. So SEALs actually, they come with a sense of humor, and that's, that's again, is good advice for life. Don't be afraid to enjoy yourself every single day. Smile. Because... Um, Think about this. None of us are getting out of this alive. I don't believe in statistics, but I am pretty sure 10 out of 10 people die. So enjoy yourself. Well, you talk, you, you talk about sense of humor, um, and clearly uh, Army guys have a much better one. Absolutely. Um, but uh, They have a lot of time to think about jokes when we're doing the missions. Yes. <laughs> We won't talk about who uh, pulled you off a mountainside. Anyway, um, so, uh, uh, but uh, you talk about sense of humor. Um, 
why don't you share like one or two of the stories about uh, even in Bud's training uh, where you first got introduced to the sense of humor? I got in the first time I realized that there was a sense of humor aspect was um, they they had um, 220 of us that started out Bud's class 208 uh, Navy sailors that wanted to be seals and we'd read the books seals write a lot of them and we'd seen the movies but we didn't know what seal training was. Like, what, what do we do every day? Where do we show up? So they, they actually sat us in a room and brought a, a SEAL instructor in to explain to us what we're going to do. Like, here, here's what BUDS is. Here's what, and, uh, he, and oh, by the way, too, that you can tell with the banter that, like, sense of humor is common among uh, special operators in the military, so that's, that's, that's funny stuff. But we learned this the first day. This instructor came in uh, walking on a stage kind of like this, and we're looking at him like you're looking at me, except we are terrified. Like, this guy is Superman, and he can kill us if he wants to. And so, so he's looking. He, he's the first SEAL we'd ever met. He looks like a SEAL, right? Camouflage pants, blouse in a tight, shine boots, a, a blue T-shirt. It says UDT SEAL instructor. You know, the guy's ripped. He's got tattoos down to his knuckles. Uh, he is a Navy SEAL, so he's obviously ridiculously good looking. <laughs> and he stood on the stage... And, you know, and like I said, we're staring at him, and he's in silence, and he kind of relished the silence. And then he finally broke it by saying, looking good today, gents. Not you, me. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. I look a little tired. It's because I am. I was up all night. I had to get my wife out of jail. <laughs> she was arrested for shoplifting. Earlier that afternoon, we were leaving the mall together. She had her arm around me. Security thought she was trying to steal an anatomy chart. <laughs> and we're just sitting there like, what is this psychopath talking about? <laughs> so what we, we later realized is that he was, he was messing with us. He was early, he was bored, and he'd been there before, and he thought he would have fun at our expense. And so he actually, that, you, you sit there and realize, other than he might decapitate me, this guy's funny. So that kind of, that's how you kind of get used to kind of a, a rough yet dry sense of humor. That's that's kind of what we get used to. And that's I mean we even saw it on the uh, the Bin Laden mission. I don't mean to fast forward too much, but we I was in the helicopter that didn't crash, which is which is a good thing. And uh, when we got in, we didn't know the other one crashed. I don't, I don't mean to fast forward, but we, we got inside the house, and I didn't know it crashed. The guys on my helicopter didn't know it crashed, and um, we're inside. And one of the guys from the helicopter that crashed said something something helicopter crashed. And I said. What helicopter crashed? And I'm thinking they sent other guys in that just got shot down. We lost 30 of our friends. And he goes, bro, our helicopter crashed in the front yard. You walked right past it. <laughs> so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to calculate this in my head. And as we're doing so, one of the snipers that had our dog was running around the entire compound to, to make sure there was no outs. And he, he went up to this, the famous spot where you can see the tail of the helicopter Right? And so he came to that. He didn't know it crashed either. And he came, as we're having this conversation, he comes over to the radio and said, Hey, guys, be on alert. They are ready for us. They've got a training mock up of our super secret helicopter <laughs> in the front yard. <laughs> and this is on the most important mission since, like, Normandy. And you hear the ground force commander go, Well, no, you jackass. That's ours. We crashed. And he, he had this awkward pause, and he said, yeah, that makes a lot more sense than the shit I was just saying. <laughs> so we, we stayed funny the whole time, I guess. So uh, obviously SEAL training is uh, relatively long. Um, there are lots of ups and downs throughout it, but uh, what's the one story, uh, probably related to, I don't know, not tying, but uh, what's the one story about, you know, never quit? The never quit, yeah. There's, um, um, we, we would do tests every single day um, to, to make sure you stick around. Pass or fail for time, whatever the test is, um, it, just to keep you in the program. And, and the tests aren't hard to understand. They're not, it's not like an algorithm. You're going to sit down and type code. Basically, one of the tests is it's simple. It's simple to understand, not simple to do. It's a 50-meter underwater swim. So jump in the pool, do a flip underwater without kicking out the side swim half the distance of a football field without swimming. Simple, fast. 5.5 nautical mile ocean swim against the current, pass, right? Um, we, we had tests where they would tie our hands behind our backs and our feet together 
and throw us in the deep end of the pool for 45 minutes at a time, doing different drills like exhaling all the air out of your lungs to sink, um, go up top, inhale, float for five minutes, swim hundreds of meters. They would throw pens or masks and you, you have to grab them off the bottom with your teeth. Uh, you know, you know, but the test there is introducing you what it's like to not be able to breathe, but they're instilling in you that panic will not help. So chill out, take a wrap up. You know, I, I actually, that was called drown proofing. I found it relaxing because that was an hour a day that no one could eat because <laughs> I'm under the water. But the test we had was underwater knot tying. They, they tied a rope, the width of a pool, um, a foot off the bottom. So 14 feet down is a rope. And then on the surface, there will be a student and an instructor, one-on-one, -on -one, and the student has an 18-inch rope of his own. And we're in the Navy, so we know how to tie a bunch of knots. So the test is go tie a series of knots that he tells you with this rope around that rope. So you'll be on the surface, and he'd say, okay, go tie a bowl and knot. It's like, all right, fine. So he holds your breath and swim down, and the instructor will stay on the surface with the snorkel and a mask. So he's breathing, he's watching. <laughs> so you go tie your bowl and knot, and you back off, stay down there. He comes down slowly, <laughs> and like he'll look at the knot and look at the student. And like he'll act like he's never seen it before. And, and the first one's always wrong. So he'll go back up for air, and you're like, of course it's wrong. So you untie the bowling knot, straighten it out to prove you untied it, retie the exact same knot. Hands out. It's been about a minute and 15 seconds. He comes down and looks at the knot, and he'll be like, yeah, that's good. So you untie the knot, you go to the surface, you get one breath of air, and that's enough time for him to tell you about knot number two. So go tie a square knot. Okay, fine. So you do the whole thing again, another minute, minute and 15 seconds. Come back up, one breath of air knot number three. It's a right angle, right? Anyway, so the test is simple. Tie five knots in a row the right way you pass. So a friend of mine named John was on his last attempt. They will let you try a certain amount of times. If John doesn't get all five knots right now, they're going to kick him out today. He'll never be a Navy SEAL. It's a lifelong dream. That's a lot of pressure, right? So on his fifth knot, he drowned. So the instructor came down to get him. He's, you know, he's not trying to kill him. So he grabbed John, he swam him up, and he threw him over the side of the pool, and he hopped out, he rolled him over, he's yelling for the corpsman, the medic who's on the other side of the pool. He's gathering his stuff and kind of running around. The instructor realizes that's too much time, so he straddled John, started doing a sternum rub, and then he started CPR. And uh, we could actually hear him yelling, you know, come back to the light. So John was out for a minute and a half. He finally spit up all the water out of his lungs. The first words out of his mouth were, did I pass? So the instructor kind of sat back on him, and you could see him getting the color back in his face because he gets to keep his job because he, he didn't kill him. And he goes, he goes, yeah, man, you passed. And John said, thank God, I finally tied the fifth knot. And the instructor said, well, no, you didn't tie. Look, I'm in a great mood right now, so I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I don't care how many knots you know how to tie. That is not part of the curriculum to become a Navy SEAL. My job simply is to see how far you'll push yourself, okay? You just killed yourself. You passed the goddamn test. <laughs> so that's the never quit attitude. So you graduate, you go yep. on to, uh, what was your first assignment? SEAL Team 2. And uh, they're just divided, SEAL teams are divided by number. So the odd numbers are uh, in San Diego. Uh, 1, 3, 5, and 7, and the even number SEAL teams, 2, 4, 8, and 10, or in Virginia. Went out there, did some more training, about a year worth of training, and then deployed. So we went overseas pre-9-11. So uh, fast forward, 9-11 mm -hmm. happens. Um, you know, what do you, what, one, what's going through your head, and two, uh, you had a major change, you know, major yeah, career yeah. change. Well, 9-11 was, um, uh, you know, we were all affected by some more than others, but uh, when we saw it happen, I was deployed already overseas, and we saw it happen, and when the second plane hit the South Tower, it didn't take 15 seconds for someone in the room to say Osama bin Laden. We knew it was Al-Qaeda. And uh, well, I mean, like the whole thing with like life happens around you while you're planning. My, my plan was to, after I found out what a SEAL was, be in the Navy for four years, not make it through and have sea stories, go to Maloney's in Butte, Montana, and tell them. Um, I met the guys, so I re-enlisted. I didn't want to leave them. I was young. At, when that reenlistment 9-11 happened, I'm like, well, my country trained me to fight, I need to fight. So I reenlisted, then I found out about another SEAL team and just started going there. So it, uh, we just knew we would get, uh, get to fight. And it, it, it changed from uh, going to the UK to train with the Special Boat Service 
the SBS or like the German comp swimmers or the um, Norwegian Jaegers to we're going to Afghanistan now, we're going to Iraq now, and we're going to fight uh, uh, the global war on terror, which is what it still is. And everything changed. It went from Oktoberfest to Jalalabad, you know, to the bottom of it. Well, you, uh, you've led a, uh, an interesting or had an interesting career. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the main operations and missions you were a part of was the rescue of uh, uh, Captain Richard Phillips. Yes. Uh, why don't you take everybody through kind of how that day, uh, how the alert and Yeah, we, uh, for Richard Phillips, we were actually in Virginia Beach. Uh, and it was, it was Good Friday, April 10th, 2009. And it was, that's my birthday. And as I, I was at my daughter's Easter tea party at her preschool. She was four. And uh, we were, we set up a buffet line. We're getting our kids Easter treats. This is a, a school where you know, we have Marine Corps parents, Navy parents, a couple of Army parents. And we're seriously going through this buffet line to get them cookies and stuff. And uh, as I'm walking back to my daughter, um, I got a message and Richard Phillips has been taken by Somali pirates are calling us to go get him now. So I had to look my daughter in the eyes and kiss her and say goodbye. And, and I always mention too, that's the hardest part of combat. It's, uh, it's not, getting shot at and having stuff blow up next to you is easy. Uh, looking your kids in the eye and realizing this could be the last time we see each other is hard, you know. And there's a huge difference between kissing your kid goodnight and kissing your kid goodbye. So I kissed her goodbye, turned around, and went to went to work. And here's here's actually a funny part of the story. Um, we had a set amount of time to get there. We'd been selling it that we can rescue anyone, a maritime hostage we can rescue at a certain amount of time. So I had a set amount of time to get. We'd never done it before uh, in 25 years. Um, but I was ahead of schedule, and there's a 7-Eleven outside of the base where I worked. And I stopped at the 7-Eleven with a plan. I'm going to get as much cash as I can out of the ATM along with Copenhagen and a carton of cigarettes. And the reason I'm doing this is because we're going to be jumping near the east coast of Africa at some point today. We might not end up where we want. If we land in a semi-permissive environment, I might be able to buy my way to safety with the cash. I might be able to barter with the locals with the tobacco. Um, I might end up on an East African beach on my birthday with cash and tobacco, right? <laughs> so I'm in line at the 7-Eleven to get my stuff, and there's a guy in front of me, one dude who's in no hurry. <laughs> like, he just finished the night shift, doing whatever, and not a care in the world, and I'm, I'm trying to speed him up, and one of the things this dude is dying, sorry, is buying is a USA Today, and the headline on the newspaper is about the Richard Phillips thing. Like, it's about the mission we're trying to do. And he slammed it down. I remember watching him slam it down, and he kind of announced the entire store. Man, I sure wish someone would do something about this. <laughs> so I'm like right behind him, and I'm recognizing the irony. And I tap him on the shoulder, and he turns around. I go, buddy, you pay for that shit, and we're going to do something about this now. <laughs> He stared at me and said, I'm not even kidding. Like, the national security timeline is squarely on your very broad shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, he moved out of the way. Uh, and uh, I got to work on time. And uh, 15 hours and 46 minutes later, we were in the Indian Ocean. And then uh, we rescued Richard Phillips a day and a half later with some shots from our amazing snipers. And we were able to do that because we were prepared to do it. I mean, if you think about that, like, the movie, the movie wasn't accurate. Good movie. But it wasn't accurate. I, it's funny, I always get asked that how accurate was the movie, and I'm like, well, it depends on who's asking. Like right here, 70% accurate. Happy hour when I'm talking to a lady, 100% accurate, I took all three shots. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. But, uh, <laughs> but you gotta figure, um, the snipers, that, that wasn't the mission. We weren't gonna go in there to kill the guys. We went in there to rescue the hostages. Those snipers were in their own beds in Virginia Beach four days prior. Got a, their guns didn't need to be sighted in for the most difficult shots of their lives, but they were. Because they were prepared. Even though we hadn't done it, was a long weekend, Easter Sunday. We hadn't done it in 25 years. They could have been lazy, but they didn't take, a, they didn't take shortcuts. They were ready to take the shots. That's pretty awesome. cool. Great guys. Yep. And so, mission success. Yes. So, fast forward uh, 2011. Yes. Um, you end up on uh, uh, a pretty clandestine operation. Yes. Um, and talk everybody through uh, um, saying goodbye to your family and the impact. Uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a tough one, too. I mentioned saying goodbye to your kids. I have daughters, and uh, I said goodbye to them on the Bin Laden raid, which was um, the one we knew we weren't coming home from. We, this is, we, the, what we were calling this was a one-way mission. 
We're, um, we're going to get shot down. We're going to run out of fuel, get captured by the Pakistanis or something horrible. If anyone's going to blow himself up, it's this guy. We're not coming back. So we, we were going to say goodbye. I remember taking my kids to Chick-fil-A and having the last meal that I couldn't tell them this is the last time they see each other. Uh, um, we, we were so convinced that we weren't going to make it that uh, the guy that ended up, we didn't have a set tr uh, line of who's going where, but the guy that ended up bringing me up to the Bin Laden's bedroom uh, pulled me aside and he said, hey, don't take this the wrong way. I'm going. I'm going. But if we know we're going to die, why are we going? which is legit, and I said, well, you know, we're not going for fame, and we're not going for bravado. We're going for the single mom who dropped her kids off at school on a Tuesday morning, and then 45 minutes later, she jumped to her death out of a skyscraper because that was a better alternative than burning alive inside, and her last gesture of human decency was holding her skirt down so no one could see her underwear while she committed suicide. She wasn't supposed to do that. She didn't want to do that. She wasn't in the fight. We're in the fight, and that's why we're going. You know, we, we had these, these, these talks about stuff like that, and then I, I had to write a letter to uh, my kids. And the one kid I keep mentioning, the one that was four years old in her, her um, classroom, and she, she was also one year old when we rescued Lone Survivor, Mark Strell, but she was seven. This poor girl's been through everything. I'll tell you a story about her in a minute, too. But I, had, I wrote her personally a letter. I didn't write a letter to the seven-year-old girl. I wrote a letter to the 27-year-old woman. And I'm really sorry that I missed your wedding. Um, I know you're beautiful. Thanks for taking care of your sister and your mom. What we did was noble. You know, Daddy loves you. Uh, tears hitting the page. Then I went to buy them, uh, she and her sisters, um, going away presents. I don't know what you buy young girls for Daddy's Never Coming Home presents, but I bought them. And I'm walking out of this mall, getting ready to go on the Bin Laden raid, knowing we're going to die. And I wasn't scared. I was just focused. And for some reason, as I'm walking out of this mall, I walk past a, a sunglasses hut, one of those little kiosks, you know? And I look over, and there's a, um, a pair of Prada sunglasses on sale, $240. And I'm, I'm looking at them like, you know, I'm a, I'm a chief in the Navy, man. I can't afford these. But I'm going to be dead next week in American Express. <laughs> so, so I was wearing these Prada sunglasses around. But then I start thinking, there's never a perfect plan. Nothing ever works the way it's supposed to. What if we do live through the night in Bin Laden's house? What if we need to steal a car and drive to Islamabad to the embassy? I know how to steal a car. If we do that, the sun's going to be up. <laughs> I carried a pair of Prada sunglasses into Osama Bin Laden's bedroom. Right? I didn't think about it at the time because, believe me, I had a lot of shit going on. <laughs> but we got back from a mission where we're not supposed to live, and we're getting changed. And I reached down, and I'm like, well, you've got to be kidding me. Then I started thinking, I'm not going to be in the Navy forever. Maybe I should get into marketing. This, this might work. Picture a billboard with a Navy SEAL, like short sleeve shirt, tattoos, handsome as hell. Like, <laughs> I keep bringing that up. And a gun <laughs> and a really cool pair of sunglasses. And all it says is, if you only have one day left to live, you might as well wear Prada. <laughs> So obviously, obviously uh, mission success. Yes. Uh, everyone came home. We did. Um, and uh, fast forward about another year, year and a half, you make the decision to uh, to leave the Navy. Yes. Um, talk talk to the group about you know that process and and more importantly, you know what you experienced as you yeah, of made course. that decision. Well, when we when we finished the Bin Laden raid, it was it was a, a complete team effort. I was fortunate to be with the, the greatest team ever assembled. And like I mentioned, my team was the part of the coalition that rescued the lone survivor, rescued Captain Phillips, killed Osama bin Laden. Uh, we were on the base when Bo Bergdahl walked off. We went to rescue him a bunch of times. It didn't work out. Rob's actually pretty funny. as one of my uh, loving army brothers. He said that I'm like the Forrest Gump of special warfare, only I can't run and I'm not good looking. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but we got, we got to that point. I was like, you know, we've, I've done enough. I've been too close. And then we had a helicopter get shot down on August 6, 2011. Uh, Extortion 17 was shot down. Lost 31 Americans. Uh, one of our dogs, uh, and it was like, um, you know, I, what happens now? I mean, I, I'm going to get complacent. I, I don't need to do this anymore. I want to see my kids get married. And so I decided to start the uh, out processing and um, realized I really didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, I wasn't at 20 years, not going to get a pension, and I didn't know who would hire me. Uh, I didn't know at the time that there are certain skills a lot of special operators get to include problem solving, stress management, team building, loyalty. 
that they will hire. Um, and then I got out, I, I was forced to find some people in the DC area, New York City area, some people in Northern Virginia, Virginia Beach. And um, we realized that we are employable, people who want to employ us. And I met, met with Rob Clapper, we started a foundation called Your Grateful Nation. And that's what we do now, we help us special operators um, transition because people want to hire them and now it's, it's a, uh, we, we find out what the, we individualize what the operator wants to do, find where he, want, he or she wants to live, the line of work, and then we find that company and then they get a mentor, it's like a nine month process and then uh, it, it started out as let's help the veterans get jobs, but now it's let's help your country and the economy get better because we're giving you people the <laughs> So other than the, uh, this wonderful Nixon Library event, what brought you to California this week? I, am, uh, I gave a speech at a, uh, uh, up in San Francisco. At a, at a, I'm trying to help a, a startup company. So I gave a speech, motivational speech, to a company called Google. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're going to be all right. Um, then we're down here with this. We're doing some YG and stuff. And then I get a film uh, Friday morning. Um, I'm taping the Jim Jeffries show. If, if you haven't seen Jim Jeffries, Great dude. Uh, he's a total anti, a very famous anti-gun dude. So I'm taking him to the range to shoot like AK-47s and people. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna try to blast the liberalism out of him. <laughs> ah, it's easy. It's fun to joke around. <laughs> so uh, wrapping up. Yes. Um, closing thoughts on you know your the the life to now, the experiences you've had, the book. You know, uh, anything you want to leave with the group before you? No, it's, it's it's interesting because uh, I'm fortunate. I, I last last year I gave I, I, I want to say between 250 and 300 speeches around the country and, and Europe. And what's unique is that I that means I get to um, talk to people. Uh, I get to get out and actually meet people, shake hands, and and I you know I work for Fox News. I'm on the on the news, but it's refreshing to get away from it because the country's not as bad as, as we all think it is. Like the silent majority have the loudest voices, and it's pretty positive. Um, and it's—I mean, it's—it's—it's it's, it's, it's fun too. Even on on TV, I, I have been on some of the other networks too, where they try to hit me with the statistics. I'm like, well, 65% of the people think Trump will win the election. I'm like, well, I talked to 10,000 people last week, and they disagree. <laughs> so it's, uh, awesome. it's just interesting. It's just the, um, What I've learned is that the, the country um, is a lot more patriotic, a lot more positive than a lot of people think. And a lot of the news media doesn't report that just because they want ratings. But uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great country. So if people, if, uh, if people in the audience want to find out more about uh, mentoring, employment opportunities, or more about Your Grateful Nation, uh, what's the best way Your to do YourGratefulNation.org is our website. Um, and it's, and you know, every, everything helps, because it, again, it's, it is helping the veterans, it's helping the economy. Um, and uh, anything from just awareness, like checking it out and doing a hyperlink to a friend or sending them something in one of our uh, newsletters or whatever, just seeing the veterans that we have out there, and, um, donations are great, or even you know, if you have a small business and want to hire someone that's awesome, um, that's the best to do it. Great. So you're, you're or you can find it also at robertjoneal.com, there's a, a link to that. You can buy the operator like five times to give it to your friends. <laughs> I did tell you the spoiler alert about the book, right? Bin Laden dies in chapter 23. Uh, Gentlemen, thank you. We are, we are able to do just two quick questions uh, because we are pressed for time. The first one is going to come from our, uh, this gentleman here. So Rob, Todd Spitzer, County Supervisor, I, I'm so proud to call you a friend. I've known you. You're in the most patriotic region in the entire country, Orange County, California. And I want to thank you both for your patriotism and your service to our country. We are forever indebted. Um, Rob, you tell a great story. It's about how to turn a mistake into a positive, and I think it has to do with door knock. If you would share that story, I'd really appreciate it. Yeah, there's a funny story. Thanks for bringing that up, Todd. There was a, we were always trying, we're big believers that um, uh, everybody fails. If, if you accept failure, you're going to learn from it. You can, it's a great learning tool. What's, what's our quote of the day was, uh, um, 
Good decisions come from experience and bad decisions come from bad decisions. Bad, and experience comes from bad decisions. Yep. Yeah, something like that. So, but we learned something. There was a mission we went on where we, were, we, we, used to, we learned it was important to sneak up on houses. Don't land next to them in a loud helicopter. Don't blow up the doors. Just pick a lock and sneak in. And we're learning this. And one of these times we're sneaking up on a target in, in uh, Iraq. They're being quiet. And all of a sudden, uh, people start moving around in the house. So they know someone's out there. And we see this happening. And they were like, okay, well, this is a high-value individual, an HBI. We're not going to leave. Now we are going to escalate force. We are going to put a bomb on the door. We are going to go in high. So we, um, I had a call, I was a point man, I had a call the breacher, who's a, a methods of entry guy, he'll get you in the door, in the wall, whatever. I called him up to the door, and what he decided to do was he grabbed a seven foot charge of C6. You've heard of C4, I'm assuming. This is C6. So it's like plus two of whatever C4 does. And it's a seven foot charge, and it looks like a fruit roll up. It's the same color, and it's sticky, and it's just not as delicious. And what you do with, with, with a seven-footer is you put it on the door and you roll it down. So imagine rolling a fruit roll up. And then you back away. It should be capped in. You walk to the minimum safe distance and you hit the magic button. Big, loud boom. Amazingly, the door opens. So the door opens like this. And the breacher is going to put that on this side because you know the hinges are there. Now, he needs both hands, so he has his weapon slung. It's on his sling. And I, now he needs security, so that's me. So the door opens here. I'm going to hold right here. We call it crack of the door. He's putting it on. So we're doing this. As we're doing this, it's a lesson in failure. My boss, keep in mind, this is one of the best SEALs with whom I've ever served. 16 years, of one of the best. He comes walking up, not to micromanage, just to observe. So he's watching what we're doing, and he put his elbow on the doorbell. <laughs> so it's like, bing! <laughs> and you can tell like he doesn't want to move it. Because it's, it's, it's going to go bong. So the, the breacher is right here. And that happens. And, and he can't yell at him because that's his boss, too. So he goes. Now, being fiscally conservative and not wanting to waste the taxpayer's money, he starts to roll it back up. Like all, all nonchalant. He's like, now, I'm standing right here holding the door. And I don't want to be here anymore. Because when this stuff happens, terrorists shoot through the doors, and unlike Hollywood, bullets go through a lot of shit. I don't want to be a part of that equation. So I'm standing here, the door opens. It's the goddamn terrorists we're looking for. So he and I share this awkward... And then I grab him, and I, I chuck him down, and I, I got cuffs on him. I put my knee in the small of his back and look at my boss and go, well, shit, let's do that every night. <laughs> But, like, the point of the story is what we learned from that series, because we've been fighting in Afghanistan for so long, what we learned is there are no doorbells in Afghanistan. There are in Iraq. <laughs> Very simple lesson, isn't that cool? So our, uh, our, our final question is from our guests in the simulcast. You guys got so big we had to move into another venue. Cool. This one is, uh, uh, Mr. O'Neill, your story is kind of full circle for the families of 9-11. What would you say to those families? That is the reason that I told the story. Um, I, I talk to uh, family members pretty much every day. I live, I live a lot of times in New York City, and when I'm having an argument with my fiance or whatever, or, or, or I think the stress level is too high, I will go to the memorial and kind of realize what's important. You know, you, you hear the, the stories from 9-11, the people that made the calls from Flight 93 or the North Tower, the South Tower. Nobody talked about hate, they talked about love how much I love you. And every time I talk to a surviving member, um, they just tell me that nothing will ever, it will never be closure, but this helps with the healing process. And people say, well, why'd you tell your story? Aren't you afraid? It's like, well, um, I've assumed risk before, and this is worth it. I'll do it again, because if I can, I, I gave a speech to 30 survivors of 9-11, and, and having them tell that, I, I had a, uh, um, as, as horrible as this, I think that everybody should watch a in school, 15 minutes of footage of 9-11, right before they say the <laughs> Because it's the, 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 realism, the realism of the enemy out there. I, I've had, I've, I, I've, over drinks, I've had uh, detectives, retired detectives tell me what it was like to watch 30 different people hit the ground. Um, and he said, I can sleep better at night because I know there's a story. This is what happened to the most evil 
man on the planet. So um, um, it, it's worth it. It's uh, it, you know it's, it's something that happened to us because of a really horrible version of a prehistoric religion, and, and we need to realize that's what it is. And, and um, you know, just talking to 9/11 families and, and helping with that closure, I don't have any regrets at all. And, and I, I'm kind of babbling here because it's very emotional for me. But um, Bin Laden got what he deserved. Ladies and gentlemen, Rob Clapper and Rob O'Neill. He'll be up in the front lobby to sign your books. Thank you for coming. Have a great night.